Lord. Can you look at the person next to you and say good morning? Can you ask him, how are you? Okay, let's chit chat for a little while now. Just get to know how the person next to you has been during this week, especially if it's somebody that you didn't talk to, okay? Look at the person next to you for a while. Just chit chat for a little while. Try to find out how they are doing. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus, once again for this time that we have to be in your presence. And Father, we give full attention to your word. Let your word speak to us. Let your word feed us today. God, I'm just standing as an instrument right now. Use my mouth. Let nothing of me come out, but only you, what you want to say to your people today, Holy Spirit. We give you the highest honor in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So the message that I'm going to share today is titled, To Be Transformed. But before that, I think I, I need to just acknowledge in our midst, uh, our dear friend and brother who hasn't been with us for a long time, uh, Papa Andre. Can you stand up? Can we just welcome him? Papa Andre, stand up. Let's welcome him. Yeah, we miss you. It's good to see you. Amen. Amen. Praise God. This is your home. This is your family. We are happy to see you back again, Papa Andre. And we know that what God is doing in your life, he hasn't finished yet. Amen. And you'll be seated. Praise God. It is always good to acknowledge um, those of us who haven't been around us for a while, to appreciate their presence and to just um, tell them how much we miss them. Amen. I think it's the same thing when you go back home and you see people you haven't seen for a long time, you will be happy to say hello, right? So it's a good thing to do so. So the message I'm going to share today is um, uh, transformed, to be transformed. I'm not going to speak very fast. I will take my time and I will not shout. I will try to actually teach this message. Amen. So uh, please do me a favor, take your notes, your bullpen, your phone, for you to write down some of the notes that we are going to talk about today. Amen. Um, you know, when I was growing up, one of my favorite and few artists that I really loved was Michael Jackson. Any, any fan of Michael Jackson here before? Wow. Everybody, yeah? Michael Jackson. The first time I heard uh, his song, I couldn't understand the word of the song because at that time I could not speak English. I was, I was just speaking French. But the song was, had you know, such an impact in my life that I wanted to be like Michael Jackson. Every time there was an opportunity for a party, that was a chance for me to show my Michael Jackson moves. Are you there with me? The moonwalk and all that. Are you there with me? And uh, you want to see now? <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's been like uh, 30 years. More than 30 years, huh? In there in the glass. It's, it's a bit rusty. It's a bit rusty right now. Amen. Yeah, so um, I, I loved Michael Jackson so much that um, I, I bought his album. I was, I was uh, maybe, maybe nine, not, I didn't buy it by myself, but... You know, I was asking my dad to buy me Michael Jackson CDs and, and all that because I just loved him. Whenever Michael Jackson was on TV, 
I would just run to see him sing and dance. I didn't understand a clue of what he was singing, but I just loved the music. Amen. And I wanted to be like Michael Jackson. I believe many of us here today, we also admired some people and we wanted to be like them, right? Growing up. And the same truth is also for us as believers. The Bible says that we are called to be like Jesus Christ. Amen? We are called to be like Jesus Christ. And God is transforming us. We are growing to be more like Jesus Christ. And God is transforming us in seven keys, key areas in our lives. There are seven areas in our lives that God wants to transform us. Are you there with me? And those areas are our spiritual life. God wants to transform our spiritual life. God wants to transform our physical life as well. Because he wants us to be healthy. Otherwise, there will not be a need for healing. Amen. We have healing because God wants you to be healthy. And God wants to transform us in our emotion, in our mind, in our relationship, in our finance, and also in our job. So these are some key areas that the Lord will transform us so that we can be more like Jesus Christ. Not like Michael Jackson, but more like Jesus Christ. Amen. Can I hear an amen there? Look at what the Bible says in 2 Corinthians Chapter 3, verse 18. I am reading from the New King James Version. The Bible says, But we all, that means you and I, with unveiled face, beholding as a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed. A very important word. Being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. So you see, I've underlined the word of being transformed. It's important. Why? Because it helps you to understand that you need to be patient with yourself. If today you fail because you, you have a certain aspiration, like for example, me, I wanted to try the moonwalk, but I failed so many times, I will not beat myself down because of that. Are you there with me? Why? Because I am still under process. I am still under process. God is still walking with me. I am being transformed from glory to glory to the same image of Jesus Christ. Amen. See, the word glory, in, in Greek, it means doxa. And in Hebrew, it means kabot. And Kabot expresses the personal opinion that determines the value of something. Like an appraisal. So for example, if you have a jewelry, you don't know the value of that jewelry. What would you do? You are going to find somebody who is going to appraise it, right? Is going to tell you the value of that jewelry. Am I speaking to somebody here today? So that is the word glory used. That's the word used. It means that our value is increasing every time we are looking at Jesus Christ. Are you there with me? There is an increase of value every time we are becoming more and more like Jesus Christ. Amen. So the glory of the Lord is like a mirror in which we can look at ourselves. We look at the glory of God in a mirror and we gradually become like the image we are staring at the glass, at the mirror. That's the goal. That's the objective, to be more and more like Jesus Christ. Your face, your appearance has to fade away and Jesus must come forth. Are you there with me, people of God? So, 
to accomplish this, for the believers to be transformed, God gives us six elements he uses to transform us to transform us god used six elements for transformation and those elements are coaching can you say can somebody say coaching learning the truth new mindset cleaning the house honest community and faith so these are the elements that God uses to transform us, to change us to a new person, to change us to become more and more like Jesus Christ. Amen. So today I am going to talk about two or three of these six elements that God uses to transform us. So first, let's talk about God uses coaching to transform us. I want to show you a picture here. Do you know this man? Talaga? You don't, you don't, okay, some of us don't know him. But those who are from the Philippines, they will know who is this man. Yes. Yes. But we know, do you know this guy? We know him, right? Can, can we be together? Amen. Let's, let's, yeah, try to respond to me here. So this is Mani Pacquiao, my brother. No, I'm joking. <laughs> Mani Pacquiao. Mani Pacquiao is one of the greatest boxer ever. Everybody knows him for his accomplishment in boxing, for his achievement in boxing. Can you go back to the previous image again? But how many of us will know him? Freddie Roach. Few of us, right? But you know this is the guy who discovered Mani Pacquiao? He's the guy who helped Mani, Mani Pacquiao to reach another level in his boxing career? This guy is Mani Pacquiao's former coach. They have been together for more than 30 years in a career, in a boxing career of Mani Pacquiao. Are you there with me? Brennan, can you go to the next slide? So look at what Mani Pacquiao said about him on the day, on the birthday of Freddie. He says, happy birthday to the best trainer in the world, my mentor, my best friend. Indeed, if Freddie Roach did not discover the raw power of Mani and understand how to use it, maybe we would not know Mani Pacquiao today. I, am I speaking to somebody here today? So God does the same thing as well. God uses coaches and I want you to understand this. The benefit of having a coach in your life is this. You can grow faster with a coach. Amen. You can go faster with a trainer and a coach. And you can see not just Mani Pacquiao, any athlete that you can name, they always have a coach and a trainer. If you're happy and you know we clap your hands. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. If you're happy and you know it, and you really want to show it. If you're happy and you know, stand up. Do you know why I'm doing it? Because I want to keep your attention to me, amen? Don't worry about the kids. They will worry about themselves. Stay focused here. Amen. So... All athletes in this world have a coach. All the great athletes, they have somebody who is sharpening their skills. Maybe the coach may not be as skillful as the athlete, but he has the wisdom and the knowledge on how to maximize the skill of the athlete. Are you there with me? 
So this is what the coach will do. The coach will maximize your strength and minimize your weaknesses. He will capitalize on your strength and help you to know how to maximize your weaknesses. Are you there with me? Yeah. That is why having a coach and a mentor in your life is so crucial. There is nobody, even in the Bible, who succeeded without having a mentor or a coach. The Bible speaks of Moses. Are you there with me? Did you know that Moses had a coach? Did you know that Moses had a mentor? Hello? You did not know, right? No, his, his mentor, his coach was Jethro, his father-in-law. Ah. Jethro was, Jethro helped Moses in macro management. Moses was experiencing burnout. He was getting so tired. He did not know what to do. He had to manage more than two million people. He himself. Can you imagine that? And Jethro stepped in and said, no, my son, this is not the right way. Are you there with me? So for you to succeed in your life, and for you to be more like Jesus Christ, you also need a coach. You need a mentor. You need a trainer. You need somebody who is going to sharpen your spiritual skills. Amen. You need someone who can teach you. Amen. Sometimes, sometimes we... We don't allow people to teach us, to mentor us because of pride. Amen. We think we know it all. Amen. Amen. And, and my, my mentor, Tata Emil, he taught me to call it acne. Can you say acne? Acne. I forget, I forget the acronym in Tagalog, but there is an acronym in Tagalog, which means I know it all. I know. Hallelujah. So in the scripture, we see that God is giving us five types of coaches and trainers for the growth of the believers. There are five types of coaches and trainers that God gives the believer for them to grow. Amen. It's just Daphne, don't worry, amen. Yeah. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 to 12. The Bible says, Now, these are the gifts Christ gave to the church. The apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers. of coaches that God has blessed the church you see the word says it's a gift amen 
God has, give, has gifted the church with prophets, with apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And their duty is to do what? Is to equip the saints. And they are equipping the saints for the saints to do the work of God. Amen. And the saints are doing the work of God to build the church of God, which is the body of Christ. In other words, in other words, in God's agenda, every believer is a player. In God's agenda, every believer has a part to play. You have a part to do. Amen. God is not calling us to be idle or idle. God is calling us to be active, to be involved. important help me to look at the person next to you and say you are important your role is important amen but we need to allow what God has given us to be used for our build up amen hallelujah so, 2 Timothy, chapter 2, verse 2. 2 Timothy 2, 2. The Bible says, You have heard from me teach things that have been confirmed by many reliable witnesses. Now, teach these truths to other trustworthy people who will be able to pass them on to others. Amen. Amen. You see what the plan of God is? What you receive from God, God wants you to pass it on to other people as well. Amen. It's like a relay race. You are running your race with a baton. And you don't need to hold that button. You have to pass it on. Amen. You know, there are so many believers who have been believers for 30 years. But they do not disciple anyone. Are you there with me? Amen. God is calling us to pass on the button. Look at the picture that, that we have there. The plan of God for the growth of the church. You see, God wants us to be coached. God wants us to be discipled so that we, in turn, can also coach and disciple other people. The commandment of God is still the same. His commandment is to go to all the world and make disciples. Amen. And... He says in Matthew 28, it's not there, verse 19, all authorities have been given to me. Therefore, go to all the world and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them everything I have taught you. Amen. Amen. A Christian must be involved in the business of discipleship. Amen. Amen. You need to be involved in the business of discipleship. It is not just reserved to the pastors, but it's for every believer. That is why you have the pastors, you have the evangelists, you have the prophets, you have the apostles to equip the saints to do the work of God. 
Haleluya. So we talked about that God uses coaches to transform us. The second point, God uses truth to transform us. To know the truth is very important. Jesus says the truth will set you free. In John 17, 17, the Bible says, this is, it, this uh, chapter, chapter 17 of John, it is called the sacerdotal prayer of Jesus. It is his prayer as a priest to God because Jesus was also a priest to God. And then in chapter 7 of John, just before he is arrested, Jesus made this prayer. In your free time, go home and read the entire chapter. It's so powerful and so beautiful. It presents so many truths and speaks of the heart of God, the heart of Jesus for his church. So in chapter, in verse 17, Jesus says this one, make them holy by your truth. Amen. Amen. Teach them your word, which is truth. Jesus says the truth of the word of God sanctifies us. You want to be holy? Know the truth of the word of God. Amen. If we want to change and align areas of our lives to God, we must know the truth of that particular area of our lives. What is the truth of the word of God regarding my finances? What does the word of God say about my finances? What does the word of God say about my health or my physique? What does the word of God say about my spirit? Are you there with me? What does the word of God say about my mind? What does the word of God say about my job? Are you there with me? We, when we know this truth, you see the Bible says that we will be set free. Because you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. Can somebody say amen? amen. We must know the truth of the word of God. Amen. Amen. Because the truth of the word of God will change us. You see, there are so many people who believe in the lie of Satan. For so many years they have believed in the lie of Satan. Satan has kept them bound because of his lies. Amen. I remember I heard, I heard a story of a father... He did not want his children to access a certain room. So for them not to access that room, the father told them there is a ferocious dog inside the room. If you go there, that dog will eat you. Are you there with me? And then to make the things believable, he registered a recording and he placed it in the room. So every time the kids try to get close to the door, they are going to hear... <laughs> And the children believed there is a door behind the door. There is a dog behind the door. Are you there with me? And he prevented them from opening that door. Amen. Do you know what was behind the door? Children, candies. Are you there with me? The father knew the moment the children will know there are, the candies are there. Or in one day, everything will go. So for me to make sure that they don't finish all the candy, let me bring this story to them. And that is the same thing with us. Satan has kept us from the blessing of God because he has presented the truth in our life, a lie in our lives. Amen. Am I speaking to somebody today? So we need to know the truth. Amen. When we know the truth, the truth will set us free. The truth will change us. 
You see, we also become mature in Christ by knowing the truth of the word of God. That is how you are going to become mature. When you know the truth of the word of God. Amen. So there are five ways. There are five ways that the word of God will help us to know the truth. There are five ways the word of God will help us. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 to 17. Is it there in the PowerPoint? It's not there. All right. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 to 17. I am reading from the New Living Translation. The Bible says, All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip us, his people, to do every good work. Amen? So, God's word does these five things in our lives. Number one, God's word teaches us the truth. You cannot know the word, you cannot know the truth unless by knowing the word of God. Amen. Number two, God's word shows us the path to walk on. God's words show us where we got off the path. God's words we reveal will show you the mistakes that you have made. And it's not just going to show you the mistake, but it's going to bring you back in the right path. Amen. And the word of God will also show you how to stay on the right path. Are you there with me? So what is the objective of knowing the truth of God? What is our objective? Why do we need to know the truth of God? Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14. Yes, people of God, we need to know the truth of God. Ephesians 4, 14, the Bible says, <coughs> Then we will no longer be immature like children. We don't... I'm sorry, we won't be tossed and blown away, blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced by the people when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. So what is the objective of knowing the truth? Is to become more like Jesus Christ. Because Jesus is the final goal, is the ultimate goal of the believer. He is that image that we are looking to and that we want to be like. So knowing the truth will help you, will help us every day to be more like him. I don't want to be like me. I want to be like Jesus. You see, sometimes we say that God loves you the way we are. Yes, he does. But he loves you so much the way, he loves you so much that he doesn't want you to stay the way you are. You know you where you are. Are you there with me? You know yourself, right? Your short temper your lies, your flows, your anger management. Are you there with me? Are you sure you want to be the way you are? Amen? I like that no. With assurance. Amen? So we need to be more like Jesus Christ. 
we need to be more like him. Amen. Um, Mahatma Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi once said, I will just paraphrase what he said. I, I can't remember the full quote, but it was something like this. He said that um, Jesus, I will believe in him, but Christians, I will not. Somebody say why? Oh, okay. <laughs> I thought, it, I thought I said to myself in my head, why? <laughs> okay. Yeah. So the story behind is this. Mahatma Gandhi was very disappointed when he went to South Africa. He was in a community of Christians. What he read in the scripture about Jesus was not translated in the community of Christians. Are you there with me? Jesus is about love. It's about forgiveness. It's about sacrifice. It's about acceptance. But when he was in that community, he was just experiencing the opposite. So he came to conclusion and he said, no, you Christians, I don't want to do anything with you. I just prefer Jesus. Are you there with me? But it's not supposed to be so. Amen. It's not supposed to be so. It's supposed to be when somebody comes to, to you, because you are a Christian, they, can, they don't just see, you know, your name, your title, Christian. They see Jesus through you. Are you there with me? It, you are not perfect, but they will see Jesus through you. The characteristics of Jesus must come out of you. Jesus is love. Jesus is mercy, is forgiveness. But if you don't show love, no Christ in you. If you don't show forgiveness, no Christ in you. Amen. So the objective is to be more like Jesus. And how can we be more like Jesus? We need to know the truth. We need to allow mentors to guide us. They may not be perfect, but God has appointed them for a purpose. Amen. It's a gift from God for you to be more like Jesus. And the beautiful thing about that is that it's like we are all working together to achieve that image. Amen. And here is point number three. Very important point. I think I've been speaking about this point. It's the third time now. God transforms us by giving us a new mindset. <coughs> Sorry. God transforms us by giving us a new mindset. Can you say new mindset? People of God, if we don't change the way we see things, if we don't change our mindset, we will always have the same results. Amen. If you don't change your thinking, you will not change your living. So God needs to transform our mindset so that, again, remember the ultimate goal is to be like Jesus Christ. <coughs> Sorry, can I have some water, please? Amen. Amen. Listen to this truth. The way you think, can you? Listen to this truth. <clears throat> the way you think determines the way you feel and the way you feel determines the way you act amen look at what Romans chapter 12 verse 2 what does the Bible say <coughs> praise God thank you Lord thank you Jesus don't copy the behavior and custom of this world, 
but let God transform you into a new person. How does God will transform you into a new person? By changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you. The three dimension of God's will are his good will, his pleasant will, and his perfect will. The three dimension of God's will. How can you know the will of God in your life? By changing the way you think. Amen. Are you there with me? So what affects us? What causes us to have a certain way of thinking is our culture. Your culture will determine the way you think. Are you there with me? Culture can be seen in a broad light, can also be seen in a very specific way. I can say in the African culture, there is a way of doing things, which you may not see it in the Filipino culture. Are you there with me? Even among African culture, in Ghana, where Prof. Eric is from, they have a way of doing things that you will not see in the Congo. Actually, there is a battle between Ghana and Nigeria. Jollof rice. Those of you who not understand because it's not from your culture. Are you there with me? So what is jollof rice? It's a way of cooking rice. Are you there with me? So in Ghana, they have their way of cooking rice, and in, in, in Nigeria, they have, they have their way of cooking rice. But we don't know which one is the best. Are you there with me? Ghana says, theirs is the best. Nigeria says, theirs is the best. Me, I say, all is good. Amen. As long as I eat and I'm full. Amen. So our culture affects the way we think, your upbringing, listen to me, people of God, your upbringing affects the way you think. Amen. Because your thoughts, the way you think, will dictate your behavior. And when we talk about behavior, we are talking about the things that you do. Amen. Amen. If you are from a household where people don't say good morning to each other in the morning, you will not know how to say good morning to people. We cannot blame you. It's your culture. If you are in a household where people don't brush their teeth, you will not brush your teeth. Amen. Why? It's the culture. But then the Bible says that we need to change the way we think. We need to change our mindset. We need to change our culture. Amen. So that we can become a new person. Hallelujah. And another, way, another thing that affects the way we think is the thing that we give time to. The magazine that you read, the kind of movie you watch, the kind of news you listen to will affect your thinking. If every day you read gossip magazine, you know what you are going to be interested in? Gossip. Jenny Lou, did you hear that? Oh my God. Are you there with me? So we need to be careful on the things that we are reading because they will shape you. Amen. My daughter, my way, she loves reading books. She loves reading books. I remember there, there are times, I remember she was still little. We would tell her to go to bed and sleep. You know what she would do? She would put the blanket over her head and she's still reading under the blanket. Are you there with me? And the problem now, it's good to read, but the problem now She's reading everything that she sees on her way. Are you there with me? But you see, us as parents, 
will tell her daughter, not this one. Maybe we, you can read another one. Amen. Why? Because we know what she reads will become her belief system. And what becomes your belief system will become your behavior. Am I speaking to somebody here today? So be careful with what you read. Spend more time reading the Bible. Put away those magazines aside. Read more the Bible. You will know the truth of the Word of God. And that truth will change you. Amen. Am I speaking to somebody here? <coughs> Sorry. Look at what Philippians, uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 21 to 23. What does the Bible say? Since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, throw off your old sinful nature. Give up your old sinful nature. Throw it off. And your former way of life. The Bible says our former way of life is corrupted by lust and deception. Now verse 23, verse 23 is a key verse. It says, instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitude. We let the Spirit of God to renew our thoughts and as our thoughts are renewed, our attitude will also change. It's not the opposite way. Your attitude will not change as long as you have the same mindset. Amen. So what is the goal? What is the goal? Why do we need to have a new mindset? Why do we need we have what do we need to have a change of attitude why galatians chapter 5 verse 22 to 23 are you there with me people of god the bible says but the holy spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives the holy spirit produces this kind this kind of fruit in our lives love joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Can we look at this fruit one more time? This is the goal, to have a renewed mind, to produce love, joy, Peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Amen. And the Bible says, there is no law against these things. Amen. So the goal for us as believers is to produce the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit must be evident in your life. Whether you speak in tongues or not, what is important is the evidence of the presence of the Spirit of God in you. Amen. That's what is important. God wants to build our life. Now the problem is this. What do we do? We try to change the way we act without changing the way we think. Amen. We try to change our behavior but we don't change the way we think. You can do it one week, two weeks, three weeks, but because your thought is still the same, you will find yourself going back to that again. 
Am I speaking to somebody here today? So if you want to change your behavior, you want to change the way you act to be aligned to God, you must start by changing the way you think. Amen. Amen. Um, in, in the unified prayer, I talked about a principle that we called the T principle. Can, you, can somebody say T? T is like the tea we are drinking. T E A. So the T principle says this Your thoughts. <laughs> Amen. The T the T principles says this. The way you think will affect how you feel. Amen? The way you think will affect how you feel. And how you feel will impact your actions. Have you ever experienced that? You did something because you thought about it first and it made you feel somehow, and then you did it. Amen? Before we do something, we first think about it. And we think about it for a while. And sometimes we even dream about it. And then it becomes, it makes us feel a certain way. And ultimately, it's going to lead to certain sets of action. For example, in 2010, <clears throat> I was working for um, a, ma a marketing company. At first, I loved the job. But after some times, I started to think about the job in a way that wasn't very negative, wasn't very positive. Are you there with me? Why? Because my colleague, began to tell me things about the job that I did not know. Are you there with me? And he met me. It, I started to think about that. Oh, now I'm looking at the things. When she, oh, that's what he said. Are you there with me? And I became so tired about this job. Every little thing, what I used to endure, now I cannot tolerate anymore. And I would go to my wife, I would tell her, I just need to quit this job. I cannot take it anymore. Are you there with me? And I am finding all reason for me to quit the job. Have you ever experienced that? Yes. You find all the reason in the world. The boss doesn't love me. Today she didn't say hello to me. She looked angry at me. Are you there with me? Yes. And then ultimately, you know what I did? I quit the job. But sometimes when I, when I think back, I said, man, maybe I should have stayed there for a little longer. I could have learned more. Regardless of what was going on, I could have learned more. Amen. But what made me quit the job? Because I changed the way I thought about the job, the company. Amen. And I believe so many people are like that. Even in our relationship. The first time you met your wife, your husband, oh, you are my sunshine, my every sunshine. You make me happy. But then, you are married. He snores. Are you there with me? Or he kicks you out of bed without knowing. Am I speaking to somebody? And the next thing you start to say, ah, look at him. Hmm. Amen. Before he was the most handsome man, the most beautiful woman in the world. But now, she's so ugly. Why did I marry her, Lord? Amen. Why did I marry him, Lord? Are you there with me? 
Yeah, so we start to think about all these things. And then you see, it's going to create a certain feeling inside of us. And because of that feeling, we will start to act out. Are you there with me? Many of the decisions that we've made in the past, and we are sorry about them, is because we thought a certain way about a certain situation. Amen. Do you think it's the will of God? It's not the will of God. There are so many things we, we can avoid in our lives if only we have a new mindset. If only we have the ability to look at a circumstance through different lenses. I, I, as I'm closing, I want to share with you um, the story of this man. I think we all know him. I mean, he has been a public figure for so many, many years. But I still believe that his, his life is still an inspiration to us. How do you say his name? Nick Vujacic. Amen. Let's just call him Nick. Amen. It's easy for all of us. So Nick is born in a Christian family. He is born in a Christian family. He has siblings. But he, him only is born, was born, I should say, without limbs. Growing up, it was so hard for him to accept it. You see, in, in, his, in his personal story, he said at the age of 10, when he was 10 years old, he thought of killing himself. Can you imagine a 10-year-old kid thinking about ending his life? Why? Because of the way he looked. There are moments he would ask himself, he would ask God, Lord, what sin did I commit for me to be like this? Why me, Lord? My brothers and sisters, they have legs, they have hands, why not me? Lord, I will pray and I believe you will give me legs, you will give me hands. This coming Christmas, as a Christmas gift, I am going to be a good boy. This is what he was praying for. You know what? Christmas came, no legs, no hands. It became too much for him to bear that he wanted to end his own life at the age of 10. Amen. Is he dead? No. Amen. He is alive. So let's ask ourselves, what has changed about him? Did his circumstance change? No. He's still the same. Still no limbs. What changed in Nick is his mindset. He learned to look at his infirmity, not as infirmity, but as a blessing, but as a strength. Are you there with me? I forget he has a tagline that says, um, without, without limits. Instead of saying without limbs, he says without limits. So much so that this man without limbs has done so many things that me, who has two legs, have never done and I will never try to do. Are you there with me? For one, surfing, it's not in my agenda. Amen. But his mindset, 
his mindset. Some of us, we are praying for God to change the situation in our lives. Maybe God is telling you, don't pray to change the situation, but pray to change your mindset. Pray that you will be able to look at this situation with different lenses. Change your glasses. Change your glasses. Am I speaking to somebody here today? Do you want to be more like Jesus Christ? Change your mindset. We are, we are going to sit down and bow our head and reflect on the words of this message today. Can we bow our head? Mm -hmm.